Welcome back to Bible in a Year. We're reading John, and John is my favorite gospel. John was written by the Apostle John, um, the beloved disciple, and he also wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and then when he was an, an old guy, he wrote Revelation. While you're reading it, some things to watch for is you should watch for the themes of light and darkness. When it says it was night, for example, when Nicodemus comes to see Jesus, it's night. He comes out of the night to see Jesus. And look, at, look for details in John. John is in one of the resurrection appearances. Um, when they haul in the fish, they haul in 143 fish. And when the feeding of the 5,000 happens, Jesus mentions that, or John mentions that everybody sat down on green grass, that the grass was green. And look for when he mentions that there are rocks in the road. Look for the details while you're reading John. John has more details than anybody else. And you might want to ask yourself, why did he feel that it was important to mention these? Look for world. Um, world is not like the regular world that you see around us. World tends to mean the forces that are um, against God, the forces that are against Christ. World is not a neutral term. World is a very negative term. So watch for world and the way that John uses world. And another key term to watch for is believe. This is a key concept for John. John is written so that you may come to faith. Also, speaking of coming to faith, notice how many of the stories you don't know how they end while you're reading. Like the Nicodemus story, for example. You don't know at the end what he does. Nah, but that's because you're supposed to ask yourself, what would I do? What do I do? Um, so notice that. Believe is very important in John. It occurs more than 90 times in the whole gospel, so watch for that. The theme of John is that Jesus is the eternal Son of God. And Jesus is so divine as he walks through John. You're going to see this at the crucifixion. Jesus doesn't just die. He lays down his life. Um, when he says... It is finished. And then he dies. He's in charge of the whole process. Um, one of the things that you're going to notice in John is how many times he uses the phrase, I am. I mean, somebody went through and counted, and it's like 134 times that he uses the phrase, I am. Seven of these are really important, but all of them are pretty important. Remember in Exodus chapter 3, 14, when Moses says to God, when they ask me what your name is, what shall I tell them? Who shall I say sent me? God says, you tell them I am. I am. I am who I am. Um, tell them that I am sent you. Um, I am is the name of God. And Jesus uses this a whole lot of times in John. Seven of the I am sayings are really important. And these seven are... In John 6, 35, where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. In John 8, 12, where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. In 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am. And I want to make, a, make an aside here. Those who are hearing him really understand what he's saying. And so they go to pick up rocks to stone him. They want to stone him then for blasphemy. Because it's blasphemy if you say that you're God and you're not. Except, of course, Jesus said he was God and he was made out of the same God stuff as God is. In chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, which everybody loves. And in chapter 11, Verse 25, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. 
And it's the raising of Lazarus that is what precipitates the authorities deciding that's it, this guy's got to die. Life is so important in John. Life, life, eternal life that begins now and just walks through death. It's called realized eschatology. For those of you who like the fancy word, look at 14.6 where he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And then look at 15.1, I am the true vine. But Jesus uses I am more than 134 times in John. In the, in the very beginning, you've got the prologue to John. Um, and the prologue of John is chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. And it's letting us know that Jesus is the most perfect and complete expression of God that we can ever know. Where Matthew gives us the birth narrative and tells us about the three kings who came two years after Jesus was born, thereby fulfilling prophecy. And whereas Luke gives us a birth narrative and tells us about the shepherds and the angels who came to sing to them on the night that Jesus was born. Um, and Luke really wants everybody to know how Jesus came to save all people. John gives us the pre-existent word of God. John wants us to know who Jesus was. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And it tells how not anything was created that wasn't created through him. It's wonderful. Read through it. And the prologue is stating that Jesus is the most complete and perfect expression of God that you and I will ever know. It talks about how Jesus is God, Jesus' light shines in the darkness. You will, you will also see how many people, and, and this, is, you're, this is foreshadowed in John, in, in the prologue. Um, many people are going to fail to recognize who he is. They're going to see him, but they're not going to recognize him. But to those who do recognize him, those who do receive him, he gives the right to become the children of God. This is cool. John tells us about Jesus' ministry, his public ministry, and we've got the witness of John the Baptist, which is pointed out right in the beginning. And John sends two of his disciples. John the Baptist sends two of his disciples off to um, follow Jesus, spend the day with him. Um, and those two disciples include John, the beloved disciple. So he's with Jesus right from the very beginning. In this time of Jesus' public ministry, you're going to see a lot of what are called signs. And signs is John's word for Jesus' miracles. Signs prove that Jesus was the divine Son of God. And especially look at Cana which you'll find in chapter 2. And look at the pool of Bethesda, what Jesus does with the man at the pool of, Beth of Bethesda in chapter 5, and the man born blind in chapter 9. And compare the way the two of them react to Jesus. And pick which one you would rather be like. And then in chapter 11, we have the raising of Lazarus. These are wonderful. In chapter 3, we see Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus. And Jesus explains that salvation doesn't come as a result of what we do, but as a free gift from God. And we never do find out exactly what Nicodemus does. We think we know, but we never do find out for sure. In chapter 4, Jesus talks with the woman of Samaria. And the hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans went back 700 years. In fact, Orthodox Jews would go around to bypass Samaria so that they wouldn't have to go through it. Samaritans were the descendants of the Jews 
who intermarried with the people that the Assyrians brought in after they took all of the upper classes of the Jews out in when when Assyria um, took over the northern kingdom. And later when the Jews were, re, were rebuilding the temple, the Samaritans offered to help and that didn't go so well, as you will remember. Chapters 5 and 6 tell us about the healing at the pool of Bethesda. Um, and it also tells us about the feeding of the 5,000. And in chapter 6, um, verses 31 to 63, Jesus tells the crowd, these 5,000 people, that they just can't follow him only for the physical benefits. So, in chapter 6, verse 66, they leave. And Jesus says to the 12, what about you guys? And the 12, Peter responds, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, words that should be familiar to you. Chapter 7 to 9 show the increasing religious conflict with the with with the religious leaders. Chapter 9 gives us the wonderful story of the man born blind who comes to faith right before your very eyes. Chapter 12 verses chapter 12 tells us about the raising of Lazarus. It's the last sign. So actually chapter 11 so the leaders want to want to want to kill him chapter 11 is the raising of Lazarus and in fact the leaders want to kill both Lazarus and Jesus just keep reading and you'll see that then it then this this gospel spends a long time chapters 13 to 17 going over Jesus last evening with the disciples but you'll notice that they never say that um, anything about the Last Supper. Instead, they talk about the foot watching. In chapter 13, you've got the disciples fighting over who is the greatest. And Jesus' answer to them is the foot washing, which you find in John 13. In John 14, Jesus promises that he will always be with them through the Holy Spirit. After his death, he will always be with them. And in chapter 15, Jesus gives them the secret of fruitfulness, which is abide in him. And chapter 16 tells you about what the Holy Spirit is going to do when he comes. And chapters 18 to 20 have to do with Christ's suffering and death. And remember that Christ is totally in control of the process. Look at what's going on as Jesus is being judged. And look at who ends up sitting on the judgment seat. There's no Gethsemane in John. We don't have the story of the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus in, is in charge. Jesus is in control. Jesus lays down his life. And then at the very end, we get resurrection appearances. And we get Jesus reinstating Peter. Peter had denied him three times. So Jesus says, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, three times. And the last words of Jesus in John chapter 21, verse 22b, are follow me. John was written so that you might have faith. John is so wonderful. I love John. You're going to have fun with John. John is the gospel in which it has been said, a child can wade, but an elephant can drown. And be prepared for the, the, the way that you're going to see Jesus in an altogether new way. Um, and you're hearing this from the beloved disciple himself. I look forward to seeing you again soon at, at Bible in a Year, and I hope you have fun reading. Keep reading. Thanks a lot. Bye.